Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done hundreds of them now, and if this is new to you and you would like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com and look under the past interviews menu. Um, Buddha at the Gas Pump, this show is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it in any amount, there are PayPal buttons on every page of the website, batgap.com. My guest today is Swami Sarva Priyananda. Um, he is the minister and spiritual leader of the Vedanta Society of New York. So welcome, Swamiji. Thank you for having me. Yes. Now, you know, I often say this at the beginning of interviews. I say, I really enjoyed preparing for this interview. You know, uh, I really enjoyed preparing for this interview. Uh, it was so delightful to listen to your talks. Um, you know, so clear and eloquent and inspiring and deep. And so I highly recommend that anyone who enjoys this interview go to Swami's um, YouTube channel uh, and listen to some of his other videos. And, and they also have, the Vedanta Society also has an audio podcast that you can subscribe to. I uh, listen to a bunch of things on there. Um, so a little bit more about uh, Swamiji. He joined the Ramakrishna Math and Mission in 1994 and received sannyas in, which is a monastic vow, in 2004. <clears throat> he has served as an Acharya teacher of the Monastic Probationers Training Center at Balur Mat. He has served the Ramakrishna Mat and Mission in various capacities, <clears throat> including being a teacher, being vice principal, principal, and registrar of various schools run by the Vedanta Society. So, just out of curiosity, how old are you now? In, in human um, human years. <laughs> yeah, I have to think about that. So that is, I'm, I'll be 48 now. Oh, wow. 48, yeah. Wow, you're well preserved. You seem younger. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I hope that's not considered an irreverent question, but I was just curious. My wife and I, were, she was asking me how old you were, and I said, I don't really know. It seems like he's in his 30s. <laughs> Actually, I had uh, read this thing about uh, you know, the, uh, a rabbi comes to a congregation and he's very young and the people in the congregation, they complain to the chief rabbi that he's too young to be a rabbi. Uh -huh. And the chief rabbi writes back saying, you're right, youth is a disqualification for a spiritual teacher, but give him time, he'll overcome it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, there was some joke by Ron Ronald Reagan on this account, but I'm not going to try to remember it right now. Um, in any case, um, I thought we might start with the basics, and, um, and we'll go way beyond the basics, I'm sure, in this interview. But um, my first question, I, I think many people listening to this interview will already be familiar with many of the terms that you'll be using, such as Advaita and Vedanta and so on, Brahman. Um, but let's get our definition straight so that we make sure we're in agreement as to what these things mean. So, so first of all, how would you find, define Vedanta? Well, uh, Vedanta is the philosophy uh, embodied in the Upanishads. Now, Upanishads, again, are texts uh, found in the, uh, the core religious texts of the Hindus, the Vedas. So in the Vedas, towards the end of them sometimes, and sometimes scattered in the middle of those uh, bodies of ancient Sanskrit texts, you find these spiritual philosophical texts called the Upanishads. So if the Vedanta is a philosophy constructed out of uh, these Upanishads and uh, Vedanta ha comes in many, many flavors. But basically, if you, if you were to ask what is the philosophy of Hinduism, you would probably say Vedanta today. Uh, the particular brand or flavor of Vedanta, which uh, I and um, our order subscribe to or lean towards is Advaita Vedanta, non-dual Vedanta that would be set up against uh, uh, other varieties of Vedanta like dualistic Vedanta or Dvaita Vedanta or there are other schools, uh, the qualified monistic Vedanta, Vishishta Dvaita, they're all different philosophical positions. Mm -hmm. I would say we lean towards Advaita Vedanta because we are not exclusive uh, in that sense. We recognize that there are truths in all of these approaches. Okay. Yeah. So my understanding is that the word, Ved the word Vedanta literally means end of the Veda, right? Yes, uh, if you say, take it literally, Anta would mean end, and mm -hmm. Vedas, of course, Veda, the end of the Vedas, but uh, I can 
uh, imagine my Sanskrit teachers rolling their eyes, you know, <laughs> say, uh, end not in a physical sense. Here, end would, would mean the highest wisdom of the Vedas right. or the final conclusions of the Vedas. Yeah. And Veda, as I understand it, means knowledge, right? Literally, again, uh, Veda would mean knowledge, but the way the word is used, it, it refers to the the collections of uh, ancient uh, spiritual religious texts of the Hindus. Right. So then Vedanta would mean the highest knowledge or the end of knowledge or the final knowledge or some such thing. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, good. And then Advaita means literally not to, right? Not to. Dvaita means to, so Advaita means not to. Okay. Non -to. And, um, and so, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I'm just making sure we're on the same page. So, uh, this not to it refers to is signifying, well, you say it, is signifying what? Yes, that's an important uh, distinction to make, uh, because sometimes when I address audiences outside India, mm -hmm. especially uh, those with a Judeo-Christian background, when you speak about dualism and non-dualism, you're actually, it means different things to different people. So uh, one, uh, I think a Christian pastor told me to make it clear that dualism here does not mean the dualism between good and evil, rather in an Indian philosophical context, in a Vedantic context, dualism means that uh, the, uh, it's an ontological separation, which, which would mean that uh, the ultimate reality and we sentient beings and this universe we in inhabit if you take them as independent realities, they're all separate, independent realities. That's dualism. Uh, there's a fundamental difference between, let's put it this way, between you and God, for example. So that would be dualism. And non-dualism would exactly mean the opposite. That means there is no second reality apart from the absolute or Brahman, and you are that Brahman. So the difference which appears to us, we, we experience difference, that difference would only be on the surface, so to say, and deep within the nature of reality, there is uh, one non-dual reality, if that makes, uh, if that helps. No, oh, it helps. <laughs> uh, a few years ago, I interviewed a guru from Gujarat, I forget his name now, it evades me, but it, his fundamental philosophy seemed to be that, you know, you are separate from the creation and, and you are free and eternal and unbounded and all that but the creation is something other than you and we bantered that back and forth a little bit but i i could sort of never get an acknowledgement that perhaps you know more fundamentally there is a fund there is a complete unity and that which appears separate from you couldn't possibly be separate from you because there can't be two ultimate realities and so on and so forth but we never quite resolved it but uh what would you say to that uh, I see. I immediately see where the, that guru is coming from because, uh, uh, in a dualistic approach to Vedanta, in the dualistic schools of Vedanta, think of it as a triangle with uh, uh, three. The three vertices would be God and the world and you. Mm -hmm. So, if they are separate realities, you have dualistic Vedanta. So, God is an independent, separate reality, and you are something separate from God, even ultimately. Hmm. You retain your separateness and the world is something separate from you. That's one position. Mm -hmm. The second position would be a qualified monism, which would mean you seem to be separate, but you're actually parts of an organic whole mm -hmm. uh, of, a, of an underlying unity. So the unity would be something like uh, the parts of my body, hands and feet and head, uh, they are all separate different entities. They are, the head is certainly not the feet and feet are not the hands, but they are parts of one body. So in that same way, we are all parts of the body of God, so to say. Uh, that's one more approach. So that's not a strict dualism, but that's stri not strictly non-dualism either. So it's called qualified monism or Vishishta Dvaita. And there are many who subscribe to that point of view. But to distinguish non-dualism from all of this, non-dualism would insist that there is a radical identity, not even a unity. The body, for example, is a unified whole. But non-dualism says it's not that you are a part of God, but there is no difference between you and God. The famous equation, Tattvamasi, that thou art. Now, if you really consider that, you'll see how radical it is. That thou art means 
if I would translate it, it would mean you are none other than God, which would mean you are not, for example, you are not a body, you are not an individual being, you are none other than God, God being defined as the absolute pure being, pure consciousness, and the reverse too. There is no God apart from you. So I've heard one uh, Swami in the Himalayas put it in terms which would be shocking for a conventional Hindu that the Vishnu and Nara and, and, and Shiva, there is no Vishnu and no Shiva and no other God, none of the entire pantheon of different forms of God in Hinduism, none of them are real other than you, the uh, absolute. Hmm. So you are, you and God are a radical identity, not even a unity. So that's non-dualism. Hmm. When I hear you describe these different flavors of Vedanta and so on, I, I find myself able to agree with all of them, um, even though they may appear contradictory, because they are just sort of different. It's like the old, you know, blind men feeling the elephant thing. You know, they're all right. The elephant right. It is like a snake. It is like a tree. It is like a wall. But there's the totality of the elephant is more than all those individual perspectives. Absolutely. That's a, that's a very Hindu perspective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's been so in, in uh, India for uh, thousands of years. Um, uh, uh, there's this statement in the Rig Veda, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vadanti, which means the truth is one, but the wise speak of it differently. Mm. Now, this has been a kind of a saving grace for Hinduism for thousands of years. Uh, the common Hindu in, in a village might not be able to quote the Sanskrit back to you, but that's certainly what he or she feels, that uh, the ultimate truth is one, but its expressions can be many. You can have different forms of gods, uh, different forms of the absolute, which explains the variety of Hindu gods and goddesses, different names, different practices, different philosophies, even something that seems to be apparently so contradictory as dualism and non-dualism. You can affirm both, not at the same time, but uh, depending upon your spiritual perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, here's an interesting story about Hanuman, the great devotee of uh, Rama. Uh, Rama, who is an incarnation of God, asks Hanuman, what do you think of me? What do you understand about me? And Hanuman says, when I think of myself as a body, as Hanuman, then you are the master, I am thy servant. You are the Lord, I am thy servant. When I think of myself as a sentient being, then you are the whole and I am thy part. You're the whole, I'm a part of you. And when I think of myself as pure consciousness, then you and I are one. Mm. And this is my final conclusion. No, not that one of these three is my final conclusion, but all of them are my final conclusion. That's nice. Um, I think in this day and age, um, you know, modern physics comes to our rescue because, for instance, um, you know, you have a level on which Newtonian laws are perfectly applicable and predictable and so on. And then you have a deeper level at which those laws no longer apply. And that doesn't make the Newtonian level wrong. It just right. means it's a particular strata of, of creation that uh, has its own laws of nature that govern it. And, but there are deeper strata at which those laws no longer apply. Absolutely. Um, for example, many people ask, you are non-dualists, but when we go to your main monastery in India or we come to the Vedanta societies, we see a quite a lot of uh, practices which seem dualistic. You have pictures and you have songs and you have often ritualistic worship. But what has to be understood is the fundamental reality being non-dualistic does not contradict a dualistic experience. Mm -hmm. So. When you learn physics, you realize that the sky is not really blue. There's no real blue color out there. It's an effect of optics, a scattering of light. But when you look up again after reading all that physics, you still see blue, a blue sky and you enjoy it, knowing full well it's not blue. In the same way, you see this pluralistic universe and men and women and uh, plants and animals and uh, non-living things in this vast universe, apparently pluralistic. And you know full well there is an underlying oneness toward all of it, and you enjoy the plurality as expressions of that oneness. Yeah, mm -hmm. it becomes more beautiful that way. Apparently, Shankara said uh, the intellect imagines duality for the sake of devotion, and um, all the great non-dual teachers, contemporary and ancient, seem to have been great devotees as well as being, you know, extremely articulate exponents of, of Advaita. 
Absolutely. If you look at look at Shankara himself, uh, the great teacher of non-dualism, he wrote so many beautiful hymns uh, to Vishnu and to Krishna, to the Ganges, uh, and so on. Um, th that particular verse you are referring to, it goes something like this: uh, Bodhat prak dvaitam mohaya. Before enlightenment, dual duality or plurality can throw you into delusion. It can create delusion, can bind you in samsara. Prapte manishaya, upon enlightenment, uh, bhakti artham kalpitam dvaitam, the duality conceived for love, for mm. enjoying bhakti. Mm. Advaita dapisundaram is more beautiful, more sublime than non duality. So then that's the attitude of a non dual teacher. That's nice. Um, my teacher, my former teacher, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, once said it's like if you're lying in a bathtub and you're lying still, after a while the water doesn't feel warm anymore. But if you slosh around a little bit, then you feel the warmth. So it's sort of the duality kind of stirs up the bliss a little. That's know? a nice way of putting it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On, on the point we were discussing a few minutes ago about you know, these different schools of Vedanta and whether duality is ultimately one and, and not, um, you know, if I were speaking to someone who insisted that um, duality is uh, that reality is not is ultimately not one, I might ask, well, that which is not ultimate, what is that made of? You know, I mean, let's say he says that the the world is not. You know the ultimate, re but the world has some kind of intrinsic ultimate reality to it, in addition to the absolute or the self having an ultimate reality to it. I say, okay, well, what is the world made of? And and then you can, you, you have to start boiling it down, you know, as right. as, a, as a physicist might do. And if you boil it down deep enough, it seems to me, you get to the same ground, <laughs> okay, the same True. ultimate reality. True. If you ask uh, a non-dualist who insists on the reality of the absolute, pure being or pure consciousness. But if you ask this question, it's an interesting approach you take. Okay, leave the uh, absolute aside for the time being, but this world we are experiencing, what is it made of? If you ask that question, the answer is very interesting. The preliminary answer is why it's made of the five elements of sky and uh, air and fire and water and earth. <clears throat> or if you are more modern than the, um, I don't know how many, 150 100 or 180 yeah. uh, odd elements in the periodic table. Then if you ask further, what are those five elements made of? Are those 180 odd elements made of? And the Vedantist would say, why? They are all reducible to Maya, uh, the, uh, the inconceivable power of God, if you will. Mm -hmm. What is Maya then? Well, ultimately, Maya is nothing different from the absolute whose power Maya is. Yeah. Uh, and so ultimately, the answer would be this, so, uh, this seemingly dualistic universe which seems to be as far from God as possible, is actually nothing other than God. Mm. You would not say that it is God, but it's nothing other than God. There's a very interesting distinction. Uh, Mary Hale, one of the disciples of Vivekananda in the late 19th century, early 20th century, late 19th century, she wrote in a poem to Vivekananda, you have taught us that all is God. And Vivekananda wrote back, I have never taught such strange doctrine that all is God. And she said, you said it. He said, no, I never said that all is God. I said, God only is. The all is not. <laughs> hmm. Which is a, an important it's distinction. In distinction. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even sure I completely understand the distinction. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit. Well, for example, the best way to understand it is if you take the example of our dreams. And in a dream, I might dream that while I'm sleeping safe and sound in my bed, I might dream I'm taking a walk here in uh, Central Park in New York just outside. I can see people and trees and the lake and the sky, so many entities. And yet when I wake up, when I see that, oh, it was a dream, I realize all those people and uh, the sky and all those living and non-living beings and everything, not one of them was a second independent reality outside my own mind, outside the dreamer's mind. Mm. Exactly in the same way, what Advaita uh, wants to say or claims is that there is this underlying pure being, pure consciousness, apart from which none of these manifestations are real. So all of them are in some way expressions or appearances of the real.
Okay. So they are not a second independent reality. Yeah. Um, looping back a minute to what we were talking about with the elements, uh, I think a physicist would say that ultimately all these hundred and something elements can be reduced to up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. That's all they're yes. composed of. And some physicists would go deeper and say that underlying those, there's a sort of a, a unified field or vacuum state or something which hasn't any manifest distinctions uh, out of which um, all the manifest distinctions arise. Um, so I just want to throw that in. I'm sure Vedanta would say something very similar. You know, Rick, it's interesting to compare Vedanta and the latest discoveries of particle physics, for example. But I remember a cautionary word which one of my teachers told me, a very senior Swami in the mm -hmm. Ramakrishna order, who now happens to be the president of our order. He was teaching us the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, and we were novices. And he, as an aside, he threw this at us and he said, look, nowadays there is, uh, it's fashionable to compare uh, latest discoveries of uh, particle physics, for example, with, uh, with Advaita Vedanta. Mm -hmm. I think the safest thing that you could say is that there are remarkable similarities, remarkable parallels, but don't um, merge them yet. <laughs> uh, because uh, I remember one scientist saying that you are trivializing both. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So one has to be a little careful about saying that they are the same. Another perspective here, um, a, another senior teacher of Advaita, traditional teacher, somebody put this to him that maybe if one day the physicists can come up with a final grand unified theory, right, you can, one thing to explain everything, um, then wouldn't that be non-dualism? And the Swami said, he used a Hindi word, Jara Advaita. It would be the non-duality of all insentient things. But all this insentient order appears to consciousness. And you would have to integrate all this back to the witnessing consciousness. After all, it is only in the, put it this way very simply, it's only in the physicist's understanding in his consciousness or her consciousness that, uh, that he, uh, he or she is finally integrating different equations. And the understanding comes all of this appearance is uh, one integrated whole. Yeah. But that still appears to consciousness. And what Advaita would insist is that consciousness is prior to all of this. Mm -hmm. And there's some physicists who, who say that too. And, and also there are plenty of physicists who tear their hair out when they hear spiritual people trying to co-opt their, <laughs> their field to, exactly. you know, to explain spirituality or non-dualism. But there are physicists, and I've interviewed some, who uh, conjecture or posit that, co that consciousness is the, the so-called unified field and that um, you know those who have taken a spiritual approach to knowing consciousness or knowing that field and those who are taking the, the approach of physics are just using different tools to try to get at the same thing. In fact, uh, I'd uh, interject here that the recent interest in the so-called hard problem of consciousness, mm -hmm. David Chalmers, who's in fact right here in NYU, oh. uh, he uh, is now proposing an idea called panpsychism. Right, I love which, that. Yeah, which says yeah. that consciousness is fundamental. Mm -hmm. He says the, we really cannot solve the hard problem of consciousness by trying to reduce everything to brain states or states of neurons. Uh, we may have to admit finally that consciousness is fundamental, like space, time, matter, energy. Consciousness is a fundamental reality of the, of, of the universe. Yeah. Even there, that would be very much like Sankhya philosophy, still mm -hmm. is not non-dualism. Sankhya proposes a dualism of uh, consciousness and nature. Mm. Uh, but my point here is, uh, David Chalmers, in, in an interview, he said, if you think long and hard enough about consciousness, you either end up being a panpsychist, you regard consciousness as fundamental, you see that it cannot be solved in any other way, or you go into administration. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, now, there's another term similar to panpsychism, which is panentheism. And some people yeah. are talking about evolutionary panentheism. And as I understand the term, and I wish I had looked it up before this interview because I didn't know what we were going to talk about, but um, it has to do with the, the sort of in, the in, injection of, of the idea of intelligence into the whole matter so that consciousness is not some plain vanilla field uh, devoid of intelligence 
And this gets us into a discussion not only of the sort of fundamental nature of reality, but the qualities of that fundamental nature of reality, and by extension, a discussion about what God may actually be. True. Um, as far as I remember panentheism, uh, that is a closer idea to Advaita Vedanta than pantheism. Mm -hmm. uh, pantheism would say that this tables and chairs and uh, rocks and uh, what what you have you all of these this is what God is, but it's not exactly what Vedanta is saying. Uh, Vedanta is saying that these are appearances of uh, the reality which is pure being or pure consciousness. Uh, in fact, one of the verses in a text, Drigrishya Viveka, says, "What is the universe?" And it says the universe is a net, a network of names and forms spread over pure being, pure consciousness, pure bliss. Uh, much like the example is very interesting, much like foam on the surface of the ocean. Uh, so that was very evocative. I had heard a talk by Lawrence Cross, who is uh, some a strange person to invoke in a spiritual discussion. He's an out and out atheist. And he says the latest ideas of uh, of physics, for example, uh, they, they're talking about the visible universe as quantum foam. Uh, I'm sure physics means something very different from what Advaitins mean, but there's the use of the same term, you know, the universe is like foam on the surface of an unseen ocean of being and the uh, universe is quantum foam. That struck me as very interesting. Yeah. Um, atheists are sometimes some of the most interesting people to listen to, but the really smart ones, because True. You know, you just want to sort of debate them in your mind as you listen to them and, and see now where is the chink in their armor that you could, because uh, there are definitely holes in the logic, I think. I, I enjoy listening to uh, Christopher Hitchens yeah, Sam, and Sam Harris, Sam Harris and too. Daniel Dennett and yeah, uh, Richard Dawkins. I, I enjoyed uh, thoroughly. Uh, it's interesting to note Sam Harris in one of his books, Waking Up. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's an out, out, an out uh, atheist, and I uh, admire his school logic and his incisive intelligence. In this book, he says that um, I still don't believe in most of religion. Most of it is I regard it as superstition, and it should be dismissed as soon as possible. But he points out two traditions which he has investigated closely. One is the Madhyamaka Buddhism, the, Tibet, the philosophy behind Tibetan Buddhism. And the other one is Advaita Vedanta. And he says, I have to admit that both of these contain a core of truth, which we cannot easily dismiss. Yeah. And he says they contain the same core of truth. They're pointing towards the same thing, which is very interesting. Yeah, he's also an ardent spiritual practitioner. He's spent like years in deep spiritual practice. And I sometimes think of him like a man who has a foot on the dock and a foot in the boat and the boat's starting to slide away. So if he keeps up his practice <laughs> sooner or later, it's going to, you know, crack his atheism. But I mean, you know, and if I were to talk to Sam, I would probably say, well, you know, I don't believe in the same God you don't believe in, but let's, let's really, really define what we mean by God here. Because he, he sets up these straw man arguments about, you know, that conventional religion's definition of God and then shoots those down pretty easily. Yes, you yes. Know? Yeah. Um, I regard Advaita Vedanta as maximally supporting religion. See, the difference here is uh, Sam Harris's approach would be a minimalist approach to religion. Mm -hmm. Another approach right now is Robert Wright, for example, who is right here in Princeton, whose new book, Why Buddhism is True. Mm. I hear it's flying off the shelves in Barnes and Noble. But that's a minimalistic approach to religion and, and good uh, as far as it goes where he says that uh, definitely med meditation works, meditation ha definitely does work. And not only that, the Buddhist worldview, he says uh, it matches very well with uh, a Darwinian worldview, in fact. And he puts the two together. He's an expert in that. So he puts the two together in his new book. Now, these are what I would call minimalist approaches to religion, where uh, you dismissed with most of religion and try to take a core of religion, which can be naturalized, so to say. Um, Advaita Vedanta, on the other hand, uh, provides you with a foundation for all of religion. Uh, so religion is imagined or is understood as instrumental, as paths to ultimate enlightenment. So, uh, for example, God in Advaita Vedanta would be this absolute existence, consciousness, bliss, your own reality, but in a cosmic sense, uh, in association with Maya, the 
the technical definition of God in Advaita Vedanta is Brahman, the Absolute, with Maya is God. Brahman, the Absolute, limited to one body and mind, is me or you. But at the foundation, we are one reality. Let's continue on the God topic for a minute. Um, I've said this on this podcast before, but to, to me, that's my, my understanding and to whatever extent my experience of God is that God is hiding in plain sight that, you know, if you, and speaking of atheists, how they can conceive of the universe as being some kind of random accidental event is incomprehensible. Because if you just look closely at it in any way, look at your finger and look at a cell in your finger, which is about as complex as Tokyo and can repair and replicate itself. And you have a trillion, a hundred trillion of them. And, and that's just you. And the whole thing continues on like that. I mean, there's just this immense intelligence that's permeating and orchestrating everything. Um, and, you know, that's my concept of God. And I think that, that that's very clearly experienceable ultimately. Um, True, uh, they do have a tendency to shoot down a straw man. I mean, they put up the silliest possible arguments and then uh, are, are, the, are the most simplistic positions and then they target that. Now, there is an interesting book by a Christian theologian uh, of the Eastern uh, Christian Church, I think. Uh, but this gentleman writes in probably England or USA. And the book is God as Being Consciousness Bliss. Mm -hmm. And he says that, uh, and the names of the chapters are Sat, Chit, and Ananda, uh, pure being, pure consciousness, bliss, and pure bliss. And he says this concept is, is obviously, his, he says it's borrowed from the Vedanta in India. But he says this is the core idea in all the great religious traditions of the world, in uh, mystical Christianity, in mystical Islam, and so on. And he says, this is what uh, the atheists need to uh, consider and respond to intelligently, um, not a sort of lay person's or a folk conception of God. Yeah. Yes, it's it's too easy a target if that's if that's all they're debating. Um, and uh, I've heard, uh, yeah, never mind. I've heard for conversations with Deepak Chopra trying to go up against some of these guys and it gets very emotional, but they're like talking past each other because they haven't really yes. gotten to define their terms or you know, what they're actually arguing about. Um, as far as there's one thing I would like to mention here is religion comes in two distinct different uh, um, brands or species, if you will uh, uh, permit the term. It's like this. Um, some religions or many religions are God oriented and some immediately Buddhism comes to mind are actually I won't say self-centered that sounds bad it's a self inquiry based um, if you consider the great Vedantic dictum that thou art tattvam asi um, that there stands for the ultimate reality or God and thou stands for the individual being and the ground of that and the ground of thou, your reality and God's reality are one and the same reality. That's what Advaita wants to say. But if you look at the world of spirituality, of religion, you will find these two distinct approaches. Um, I have seen spiritual seekers all my life. I have asked them what draws you to this path. Young men who want to become monks and join the monastery. And I get two kinds of answers. One group says we are searching for I'm searching for God. Very good. That's one group. And the other group says, well, God is fine, but I'm really interested in who am I or what am I? It's an inward search. And if you look at the bigger picture, um, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and many varieties of Hinduism, like Vaishnavism, Shaivism, uh, Shaktaism, they are all God oriented. Uh, they are searching for a reality behind this entire universe. That's one approach to religion. The other approach is take something like Buddhism or Jainism or in Hinduism, you take uh, approaches like yoga or Sankhya, where the primary inquiry is into the self. What is the reality of the self? They come up with different language and different answers, but primarily it's inquiry into the self. 
Do you want me to go on with this stream of thought? This is oh, an yes. interesting ob no, I'm, observation. No, I'm listening very carefully. I, I'm, yeah, 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 I'm enjoying it. Please. <laughs> uh, I did, do tend to run on with this because it's one of my uh, uh, favorite themes. Well, I tend to run uh, out of my questions, so I'll try to get even <laughs> with you. Okay. Uh, uh, so now both of these approaches, the God-centered approach and the self-inquiry-based approach, both of them, they have advantages and disadvantages. The advantage, the disadvantage of the God-centered approach straight away is that it begins with faith. Um, you are asked to believe. And that's what people struggle with, especially today in the 20th century, 21st century. We struggle with the possibility of the existence of a deity. Um, so, for example, in these religions, in Christianity or in dualistic Hinduism, you will find attempts to prove the existence of God. Nobody attempts seriously attempts to prove his or her own existence. What we are is open to question, but we are something that is not open to question. It's obvious to us. So it's based on faith. And that problem does not apply to the self inquiry based approaches where obviously you do exist. Now, the advantage of the God centered approach is God, if he, she or it exists, is obviously has no problems is omnipotent, omniscient, um, uh, omnipresent, is magnificent if God exists. And on the other hand, I certainly do exist, but that doesn't do me any good because my little existence, indubitable existence, certain existence is beset with all sorts of problems and limitations. So I have, I certainly exist, but my existence is miserable, open to suffering and uh, death, whereas God if God exists, a dubitable existence, a doubtful existence, but God has no problems at all. Now, the beauty of Advaita here is it puts the two together and overcomes the limitations of each one in a very wonderful way. You see, if Advaita is at all to be taken seriously, then our certain existence is the proof for the existence of God and God's infinitude removes our limitations. So what Advaita points towards is a certain and infinite existence. So a certain infinitude. Mm -hmm. um, it, it helps you to overcome the doubts associated with dualistic religion and uh, overcomes the limitations which we perceive about ourselves because of our identification with body and mind. But I'm done. So this is this is a very interesting insight. Yeah. Um. <laughs> My sense is that people gravitate toward different paths, devotional or belief based or this or that, based upon their inclinations, their makeup, how they're wired, the stage of development, you know, and um, that all paths are valid. Um, they're, they're not necessarily all equally efficacious. I mean, you know, the Gita says because one can perform at one's own dharma, the lesser in merit is better than the dharma of a, another. But the, the the key phrase there is because one can perform it. So people are attracted to, you know, something which resonates with them, and maybe later on they're attracted to something different. But um, I don't know you'd probably concur with that. Absolutely, I, uh, that's one very important teaching which we stress at the Vedanta Society that. Uh, all the approaches are valid. Sri Ramakrishna, our uh, Vivekananda's teacher, he said all religions are true and they are all paths to the same realization. It's not important which particular path you follow, but you must follow a particular path, some, something you must follow uh, till the very end. Um, yes, it does depend on the inclination. Uh, if you look at the God-centered religions, you would find that they generally tend to be devotional. They tend to be about temples or churches or mosques and synagogues and devotional and some sometimes ritualistic oriented towards bhakti, uh, towards worship and love. On the other hand, if you look at the self inquiry based religions, uh, if you look at something like Buddhism or Sankhya, uh, they tend to be more introspective, more intellectual, more uh, meditation oriented. Now this, which, which one is better? It de as you said, it depends on the mental makeup of the seeker. Uh, yeah. You would find one more acceptable and then the other, yes. Right. Also, like if you live in Iowa and you want to fly to some place in India, let's say, let's say Kathmandu, um, which is not in India, but let's say you want to fly there. Uh, you, know, you have to get on a plane first from Cedar Rapids to Chicago, and then maybe you can take a plane from Chicago to Delhi and then Delhi to, to somewhere else. 
no, no one of those planes is better than the others. It's just the appropriate to each leg of the journey. Absolutely, absolutely. When we talk about the different practices uh, in Vedanta, Vedanta is primarily the path of knowledge, a path of inquiry based into what we are. But the practice of devotion, the practice of meditation, the practice of uh, selfless action, the yogas, the well-known four yogas of Swami Vivekananda, the Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Raja Yoga and Jnana Yoga, none of them are optional actually, none of them are dispensable. Uh, each plays an important role. In fact, if you look at the teachings of the ancient masters of Vedanta, whether it's Shankara, whether it's uh, Ramanuja or Madhva, they all taught different uh, varieties of Vedanta, if you will, dualistic, non-dualistic, but all of them emphasize the importance of knowledge and devotion and meditation and selfless action. Only the order in which they emphasized it and the importance they gave to each one would differ from teacher to te teacher. Mm. Yeah. You know how in the Gita, it's, Lord Krishna says, um, when a dharma <coughs> flourishes and dharma is in decay, I take birth age after age. Do you, do you kind of acknowledge a cyclical nature to knowledge that it's, it's lost and crumbles down and everything gets pretty bad and then it's revived and there's an upsurge and everything gets better and that cycle repeats itself? True. Uh, the Hindus are big on cycles. So, <laughs> uh, for example, the entire universe is supposed to go through cycles. Right. So there is creation and there is existence of the universe and it evolves and changes. And finally, everything is again sucked back into the unmanifest, into the inscrutable power of Ishwar or God. Mm. But that's not the end of the story because again, there is creation and this goes on again and again and again without any end. So, so to within creation, within our universe, uh, things go through cycles, empires go through cycles and religions go through cycles, ups and downs. And so knowledge, teachings, they are given fresh and powerful and insightful by masters. And then they tend to get overlaid by rituals and dogma and organization and politics and fanaticism until a we might call them social reformers or incarnations or great teachers who come and teach the core teachings again in their uh, pristine form. That's true. Yeah, there's a story about uh, God and the devil are walking down the road and God sees something on the ground, picks it up, puts it in his pocket. And the devil says, hey, what, what was that? What'd you pick up? And, and God says, oh, it was the truth. And um, it's the truth. And the devil says, oh, give it to me. I'll organize it for you. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's what, what the devil does. Yeah. It, it, it's um, no, no fault of the, uh, the teachings themselves or the teachers. It's a human weakness. And we have to admit, we have to be open to it, that these religions we have, they are magnificent structures, but they are old. They're really, really old. And they have all kinds of encrustations of history over the centuries. I think, in fact, three things that we should look to uh, spirituality in the 21st century is one, the harmony of religions. Uh, one thing that has given religion a bad rep, if you will, is the violence and the and the uh, uh, the you know this arrogance, if you will, that my path is right and everything else is wrong. Mm. That has to go. Mm. That really has to. It's, it's uh, high time that uh, we uh, we enjoy and we accept and enjoy the truth of all religions. Yeah. Uh, that's one. Second, uh, this contradiction th with, with science, that has to go. Uh, in, if there are things in our religions which contradict accepted and well understood uh, teachings of science, uh, discoveries of science, then we must be uh, big enough to let those uh, ideas go or relegate them to be symbolic or stories. Uh, we don't have to hold on to them fanatically. And the third thing which religion, spirituality must do is to find itself in harmony with modern values, democracy, gender equality, uh, human rights and so on. Mm. So these values are very central to our modern society and religion must be fully in tune with these. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, the astronomer Carl Sagan said something like, um, you know, how r when when there's when religious people, some of them are confronted with uh, scientific understanding that that contradicts their belief. Many of them protest, and, and you know, in a, in a way, they say, "No, no, no, my God is 
a small god and I want to keep him that way. You know, the, the, the earth is 6,000 years old. It couldn't, the universe couldn't possibly be 13.8 billion. God put fossils in, in, the, in the Himalayas to test our faith and you know, things like that. Uh, yeah, fish fossils, that is. Um, but, um, you know, I have this attitude, and this is one of my pet themes, that um, I gave a talk on this a few years ago at, at the SAND conference, that science and religion both have something very valuable to share with one another, and, and, and in sharing, each will become more complete. I mean, religion provides methods of exploration that are far more sophisticated, into deeper realities that are far more sophisticated than any, you know, particle accelerator or anything science has been able to devise. And science brings the scientific method. And even though there is all sorts of pettiness and conflict among scientists, in its pure form at least, the scientific method, you know, takes everything somewhat lightly as a, as a hypothesis for exploration rather than as a belief that you need to adhere to and fight over. And so, you know, taking that principle, anything that any religion has come up with about God, about angels, about I don't know, anything else. I mean, UFOs, whatever you want to consider, it's an interesting hypothesis, you know, and some hypotheses are much better uh, evidenced than others, and some are, you know, pretty sketchy, but there are, there's still a possibility they may be true. We need to investigate. Uh, that's right. In fact, going back to the people who are fundamentalist about their beliefs, I understand their fear. You see, if, you, if, if uh, we depend entirely on a text, uh, and then we are being asked to less, let go of a particular part of the text, a particular story maybe about creation. Then the fear is, if this thing is wrong, the rest could as well be wrong. And then I'm terrified. Yeah, yeah. So the easier option is to be fanatical and hold on to it and shut my eyes to the evidence. Mm. So there it's an emotional reaction. It's not an intellectual reaction. The answer to that would be the uh, realization that Religion is experience. Religion is realization. Religion is not belief. Um, when Vivekananda came to the West about more than 100 years ago in the World Parliament of Religions, and one big thing he did was he kept on hammering on this point that if a God exists, then I must be able to experience this God. If I have an immortal soul, then I must be able to experience this and know this and realize it and get derived benefit from it. Mm -hmm. It's not just subscribing to a belief. Now, if you deal with religion in that way, then it becomes a strong uh, contender for the truth. And you are not always sort of cornered. You feel cornered by science. Uh, you feel much more confident about saying, OK, I think evolution is a very good idea. And it's more or less uh, there's tremendous evidence in, in favor of evolution. So I will accept evolution. And all my creation stories are just that. They, are, they have got symbolic value, maybe. They have got literary value. Uh, but I will not insist. I won't, I won't be fanatical about that. Yeah. So that's what happens. Yeah. I think it was um, Monier Williams, the first one who, to, who wrote an English dictionary for Sanskrit. He said, uh, I find that the ancient Hindus were Darwinists a thousand years before Darwin. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they accepted uh, the possibility of evolution that was sort of built into Hindu thought. Those yeah. listening to this interview might enjoy my interview with Michael Dowd, who started out as kind of a fundamentalist Christian and now considers, well, he says things very similar to what you've just been saying, that, you know, in a way, science is the new religion and, uh, and gives, not exclusively or, or alone, but it, it brings a lot of, um, it enhances our understanding of how great God actually is um, what, because it's showing us such wonders and marvels and it, it, it should only increase one's appreciation for the, the intelligence which is orchestrating this universe. You know, one question I've asked myself, why does this conflict arise? Uh, what is this whole thing between science and religion? And the answer is quite disturbing. The answer is disturbing because uh, science has truth on its side. You see, what science claims is that we proceed by the scientific method. We are quite open to truth in whatever form it comes. We are evidence-based. We are experiment-based. Uh, so, uh, At least in what, principle. It doesn't always work principle. out there. Some of them Absolute. are a little bit you know, fundamental themselves. <laughs> Dogmatic, yes. Yeah. 
there is a difference between a scientifically proven um, law or uh, a, a hypothesis which becomes a law which is proven with tremendous evidence and a scientific materialistic worldview. That's a different thing altogether. Uh, that's something generated on the basis of whatever scientific knowledge we have and the tendency to reduce everything to matter and energy. Uh, that's a scientific worldview and often the clashes between the scientific worldview and religion. Um, that's why an experience based religion, religion where we take our stand on something that uh, is indubitable. That's where I find that, for example, Sam Harris, when he talks about an indubitable core of truth uh, in uh, Madhyamaka Buddhism and uh, Advaita Vedanta. Uh, there you find it's so obvious that our real nature is consciousness. If you in fact make an attempt to understand Advaita Vedanta or even Madhyamaka Buddhism, you begin to see actually that what they are doing is they are not claiming anything. They are in fact pointing to an evident fact, something that is always available to us. Uh, so there you, uh, you know, science will have to come around and maybe change their paradigm to incorporate that. Yes. Yeah, I think that in a few hundred years, the distinction between science and religion or science and spirituality will have disappeared, perhaps. Um, well, I think sooner than that. I think. Yeah, maybe so. I mean, things are moving at a fast pace, but you know, it'll just be considered, we have different tools in this toolbox. Some are objective means of gaining knowledge, you know, the Large Hadron Collider or whatever, and Hubble telescope, and others are subjective means of gaining knowledge. And, yes. and actually the human nervous system is more sophisticated than any collider or telescope. It's a marvelous instrument, which, you know, I don't think science fully recognizes the potential of, but which ancient spiritual traditions have recognized and have made great strides in ex understanding the nature of reality through its use. Uh, I think the coming back again to the hard problem of consciousness, that is a really promising area. Just imagine um, 25, 30 years ago, scientists were not seriously interested in consciousness at all. And now today, consciousness studies is big. It's mm -hmm. a multidisciplinary field. Papers are being published, books are being written, conferences being held. And uh, it's a fierce debate that's going on all the time. Yeah. How the hard problem of consciousness goes, how is it resolved? Or if not, even, if not, even if it is not resolved, how the scientists make sense of why it is not being resolved? That can open up new doors to understanding. Because um, something like Advaita or Madhyamaka Buddhism or even Sankhya, they are very consciousness based. I think they are poised to contribute a lot to this debate at this point, and this is going on right now in different universities, a new openness to these uh, ancient ways of thinking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I would suggest that, you know, it's not just an academic issue that is interesting to contemplate or speculate upon, but it has tremendous societal implications um, because, you know, if people in larger numbers begin to realize their true nature and embody that and radiate the effect of that in, in and through their lives, then that is naturally going to change the whole chemistry of society. Um, and, you know, if we, if we regard the world as it is now with all of its problems as a reflection of the sum total of human consciousness or human you know, levels of consciousness, then we can imagine a society in which a, some significant percentage of people have become enlightened or realized their true nature. What impact will that have? I mean, on society, I, I think it will have a, a, a marvelously positive impact. I, I absolutely agree with you. In fact, even uh, scientists, uh, social science researchers or psychologists, they know that uh, religion, religious faith, even of the conventional sort, has many good uh, effects on the human psyche. It prevents mental illness, uh, it uh, sustains good family life, and many, many uh, positive benefits of uh, religion, even conventional religious faith, that is well documented. Now, the challenge there is that the science seems to say, or the scientific worldview seems to say, yeah, yeah, there are all these benefits, but what good are good are benefits if they're all derived from a central lie that if uh, that God does not exist at all. So a conventional way of putting religion 
is open to these charges. Now, as you said, if it changes into a more consciousness based language, the same religious understanding expressed in a more consciousness based language as is already available in um, say Advaita or many Buddhistic approaches. In that case, we have something which gives all those benefits and is true to boot. It's, uh, it's also evidently uh, uh, testable and it stands up to a scientific inquiry or scientific investigation. Yeah. And that would have tremendous benefits for society. I think scientists are justified in being critical of a belief-based language or belief-based approach, which in many cases has led to very bizarre and unusual beliefs. <laughs> um, but if we're talking here about uh, an experientially based approach, which yes. as you just said, the words you use, you know, verifiable, testable, and so on, then, you know, we're, we're saying, you know, something which scientists do for a living and, and brought into the field of consciousness. That's the way they function. And they yeah. should be able to appreciate that and, you know, get on board with it, maybe. The advantage of this new interest, newfound interest in consciousness studies is even the concept of verifiability and the practices of verifiability, they are being now being stretched. They no longer say that it has to be in an instrument, but the reports of the individual subjects. So they will t yeah. take your, your views or your experiences and turn it into data. Right. And that's really good. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be a spike on a particular scanner. Yeah. It has to be the report of the subject under the investigation, yeah. a first person report. This yeah. is the instrument. Now, exactly. Now, the question is, you know, how can we standardize that instrument? Because, you know, if you do a scientific study, at the end of the study, you put, you list all the instruments you used and how you use them and so on. So somebody else can replicate your study and yeah. see if you're right or not. Uh, it's a lot more messy when it comes to spiritual techniques and practices. And there's so much individual variation and, you know, in, in our makeups and in what we're actually practicing. And so on. It, it's much more daunting task to standardize it. Um, I, th I think the reason it seems messy or daunting is because we are taking instruments, uh, procedures designed to deal with the objective world, and now we're trying to apply them to the subject. But I'm also uh, referring to the human nervous system as an instrument and, and the way in which that is used, the techniques that are practiced, or the variation in the condition of the instrument from one <laughs> practitioner to the next right, right. introduces a lot of var variab variables that are hard to control for. Uh, the uh, complexity is undeniable, but uh, the recent trends are very encouraging. For example, when they would do uh, studies on meditators, uh, how effective meditation is, instead of taking a general population, now they understand that the population of veteran meditators, say like Tibetan lamas or Himalayan yogis, uh, you need to take a population like that, no matter how small, to get uh, at, a, at the heart of the effects of meditation, you know, to see really what meditation does, instead of taking a standard uh, population-wide uh, uh, study. So, yes, oh, my point is that because of this interest in, in the mind and in consciousness, even the scientific method itself is adapting itself to a somewhat more subjective approach. Mm. A couple of questions have come in. It'll probably make us jump around a little bit in our discussion, but let, let's just ask them and then we'll probably get back into a, a groove of what you and I are, are doing here. Uh, here's a question from someone named Dwai, um, location not given. Sri Ramakrishna was a practitioner of Tantra as well as Advaita Vedanta. How do the two traditions complement each other, if at all? One is psychosomatic practice focused on action and the other is predicated on using the intellect to get closer to non-dual realization. Yes, Sri Ramakrishna and Hinduism in a wider context always recognized that there could be different paths to enlightenment. So say mantra yoga, it uses sound and, and words, uh, sacred words, repetition of that to take you to the breakthrough which gives you enlightenment. Bhakti yoga, it uses emotions. It uses the emotions of love to, uh, and adoration to take you to enlightenment. Raja yoga, it uses the power of concentration and focus to make the breakthrough. And so, for example, Tantra, it uses our own, uh, as he said, psychosomatic, this, this instrument, especially uh, the drives and instincts, instead of suppressing them, you uh, channelize them and uh, sublimate them. Uh, in the search for the divine. So all those energies, they work for in your favor 
in your spiritual quest. Jnana Yoga or Advaita Vedanta that uses uh, the intellect to, to simplify it uh, in an investigative inquiry into what I am. What Ramakrishna found was that all of them finally lead to the same enlightenment. The different forms, different language, different techniques. They are also he gave his famous Bengali uh, dictum, Joto Mot Totopat, which means as many uh, faiths, so many paths. In fact, that's not even a precise uh, translation. A more precise translation would be as many opinions, so many paths to God. Mm. So yes, Ramakrishna practiced a wide variety of disciplines, Tantra, uh, the Vaishnava path of devotion, uh, paths of meditation, the path of Advaita Vedanta taught to him by the monk Totapuri, and so on. And was, was he on the one who actually went through all the different religions and sort of like indulged or dove into it and became a Muslim for a while and a Christian? He kind of like correct, did, correct. did the full thing on correct. every path, yeah. Right. He in fact practiced Christian mysticism for some time and uh, Islamic uh, uh, the, uh, is mysticism for some time, mm -hmm. and he found all of them led to the same enlightenment. Mm. So he and when he would do that, he was not eclectic. So when he would practice, uh, when he practiced a Muslim way of uh, uh, of prayer, he removed all the pictures of Hindu gods and goddesses. He dressed like a Muslim, and he sort of he sort of you know emptied the bucket as it were mm. and fill, refilled himself with a new way of thinking and acting. And he came to the same conclusion that uh, all these paths lead to the same reality. Of course, he was uh, already enlightened, so it's easy for him to say. <laughs> uh, right. But that's an important thing. Experientially, uh, if it leads you to a breakthrough, which is similar it, through each path, though the paths are themselves very different, yeah. then standing from that point of view, you can say that they are all valid you don't have to fight and they are paths. Mm -hmm. Religions are not ends in themselves. You don't have to fight over them. Right. Um, you know, God is like the central sun around which the planets orbit, the different religions orbit. So uh, that is the importance of, uh, yeah, he did practice Tantra. That's true. Okay. Um, here's another question from Brad Stephan in Kearney, Nebraska. He asks, um, within the Ramakrishna order, is there a formal process for certifying and or celebrating when a monastic attains moksha? Uh, no, the answer is no, because in the Advaitic tradition, uh, it's problematic if you claim moksha. Mm -hmm. It's problematic if you claim enlightenment, expect, except for the great teachers of humanity, the avatars and the, the, the masters of each path. Who probably in didn't need to say it because it was obvious. Yes, and in general, uh, the, uh, the, the teacher or the practitioner would be hesitant to claim spiritual enlightenment. I mean, it would, for example, in our, our own monastic order, I know that uh, if some, a monk claims that I'm enlightened and they will say, the reaction will be, yeah, yeah, but you go and cut, uh, dress the vegetables, you have to go and work in the kitchen anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Chop wood, and, carry water, yeah. Yeah, and that's, I think, a healthy attitude because uh, um, and in, in the Upanishads, for example, there is a saying that in the Kain Upanishad, the one who says he knows does not know. The one who says he does not know knows. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or he may not know, but at least he's being honest. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> there's a fundamental philosophical problem involved there. Nisarga Dutta, the well, I am that the book. Um, he was a great enlightened uh, non-dualistic teacher in the 20th century. Somebody said to him that a knower of Brahman, expecting that to be pleased. And he was a rough man, so he burst out, uh, said, you're inviting me. And became, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, he was shocked. The knower of Brahman is the highest praise you can give in India. So I said, you're a knower of Brahman, how is that an insult? And Nisargadatta said, I am Brahman, I'm not a knower of Brahman. Uh -huh. And that's an important point. Yeah, yeah. that's good. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I, I heard it's not, uh, it's from some Christian mistake. The, the person does not get in, uh, enlightened. The person does not become free. You become free of the person. Right. Right. For the person to came in, claim enlightenment is therefore in principle wrong somewhere. Yeah. And even for someone to say, well, 
even though I know my language is limited, and so please forgive me, but I have become free of the person. I've realized my pure essential nature, and it's not I who've realized it, it has realized itself, and you, know, you go round and round trying to get the words to do justice to it. Um, I suppose it would be sort of considered inappropriate for someone even to proclaim that in, in your tradition? There would seem to be no need, actually. Yeah. The whole point is, uh, my realization does not directly help you. I, I remember a nice story I heard from a, a monk um, many decades ago in one of our ashrams. There was this gentleman who was a seeker and uh, who devoted his whole life to spiritual seeking and he stayed in the ashram till the end of his life. And now he loved going to different monks and finding out about their life stories and about their attainments. And he would come back and tell the abbot of the monastery. You know, I went and saw this Swami, I went and saw this Yogi, and he has got this power, and that person has got that that vision. One day that Swami, the, the abbot said to this uh, seeker, he said, my dear boy, you know, if everybody in the world were to turn into Ramakrishna, you know, the, <laughs> an incarnation of God, maybe, if everybody were to turn into an incarnation of God tomorrow, except you and me, you and I, then at the end of our lives, what good it w would all that still be to us if at the end of our lives we still remain the same, you know, and everybody else is enlightened. It would be a fantastic world to live in, no doubt about it. But what matters at the end of our lives, we are still alone and we go out with our own enlightenment, our own spiritual progress. Yeah. Was, Krama, was Ramakrishna considered to be an avatar? By some, increasingly after his death, mm -hmm. uh, he was considered to be an avatar by some. He was considered to be a great saint in, by many in Calcutta. People would go to see him mm -hmm. and he was considered to be absolutely crazy by others too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I guess that's pretty much par for the course for, yeah. for avatars <laughs> or great saints. Um, here's another question that came in um, from Francis Bennett, who is an old friend of mine. Um, does absolute non-dualism imply or advocate a passive and apathetic attitude toward all issues in the world, like famine, disease, war, etc., similar to the Neo-Advaita view, and I want to talk to you about Neo-Advaita. My feeling is that a qualified non-dualism be would be closer to the truth where it still makes perfect sense to be concerned for the difficult suffering that exists in the world and to do something about it. Could you comment on this? That's a very good question. And uh, the straight answer to that would be no, it does not uh, recommend uh, passivity. It does not imply being passive to human suffering. Uh, but yes, and the question is not irrelevant. It has been understood in that way, maybe by new Advaita and by very strict uh, monastic Advaitins, non-dualists in ancient India too. Mm -hmm. And it, it did lead to a kind of passivity regarding society, where your society might be a, a, a colony under a foreign power, uh, there might be uh, illiteracy and famine and disease and backwardness and superstition. And you still might ignore all of that because it's an, after all, it's an appearance and the, un, the absolute is, is the reality and you are the absolute after all. Now, one must notice that Vivekananda uh, at the source of our order and at the source of a lot of modern Vedanta, in fact, he was a staunch activist, a very strong activist. Uh, he went when he went back to India. He took with him the the message uh, of uh, you know uh, character building education of uh, religion. He says, "I don't believe in a religion which can't provide a piece of bread to a hungry man here and cannot wipe the tears of the widow and which promises me heaven afterwards." I don't believe in such a religion. When one of our early monks, Akhandananda, was criticized by a traditional Vedantic scholar, why are you monks going around? establishing schools and hospitals. Uh, aren't you supposed to meditate on the Atman and beg for your food? And at the most, your only engagement with society would be te to teach Vedanta. The Swami's reply was fantastic. You know, he wrote a fiery letter. He says, the very same Atman you talk about, that appears to me in the form of the hungry man. It appears to me in the form of the, the illiterate, the superstitious, the diseased person. And I shall not cease to work on their behalf, who are my very own Atman. Mm. Uh, and if for that I have to go to hell, I am re I am resigned to going to hell a thousand times. 
And that seems to have really changed the Vedantic view in India itself. You see now, uh, just not just our order, but many of the new orders which have come up in the last 100, 150 years, it's a kind of renaissance, a, a new look at Vedanta. They all are socially engaged. And today, uh, a typical Hindu in India, if he goes to an ashram, one of the questions he would likely ask is, what are you doing for the, for the poor, for the sick? Are you doing something for society? Now, that's a big change you know, in 100, 150 years. Yeah. That's nice. Um, there's a nice article which I just reread recently by um, my friend Timothy Conway, whom I've interviewed a couple of times, where he, it's about the, the three kind of simultaneously true yet paradoxical levels of non-dual reality. Um, it can be broken down in different ways, but he broke it down into three. There's the obvious conventional level where we have diseases and wars and this and that, and all that stuff needs to be dealt with. We need medicines, we need peace treaties, and whatever. And then there's the kind of a more divine level, you could say, where all is well and wisely put, and everything is divinely orchestrated and perfect just as it is. And then there's the absolute level where nothing ever happened. And, um, you know, you could take refuge in any of those three and deny the others, but a more balanced view would be to incorporate all three and to give, you know, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, give each its, its due in terms of the way you live your life. The Sargadatta, whom you just quoted, once said that the ability to appreciate paradox and ambiguity is a, is a characteristic of spiritual maturity. Absolutely. Uh, if, if you want it all neat and ordered, uh, you, have, you have to give up the truth. The truth uh, usually <laughs> is, is, is complex. Um, w uh, one way of looking at it is, uh, the Jivan Mukta, the enlightened person. Uh, it's interesting that there are three categories of this enlightened person corresponding to the three categories you just spoke about. Um, in one article by Swami Gambhirananda, the, the 11th president of our order, he says, well, how does the enlightened person look, look upon the world? And he, he finds three possibilities by looking at actually enlightened people in the in history of religion. <coughs> One is a complete indifference to the world. So if somebody, if an enlightened person is completely indifferent to the world, we have to say, we, 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 can, we have no right to criticize that person. That's an attitude and it's a possible attitude. And there have been such people and they have been enlightened. We have to admit that that's a possibility. The second attitude is that person would look upon the world, would not completely ignore it, but it would look upon the world as a play of God, uh, both good and evil as manifestations of Maya and such people. For example, there was a, a, a yogi who stayed in the Kali temple of Dakshineshwar when Ramakrishna was there in the late 19th century. And Ramakrishna narrates how the yogi would stay in meditation almost all day long, but once in a while would come out and look at the world, sky and the river and the temple and the people and would say, how wonderful, how wonderful, and would dance in joy and go back to, into his meditation. <laughs> so these are the, the crazy people of God, the crazy, mm. uh, you know, they seem mad to us. They look at the world, but they look upon it as a magic show. Mm. And the third category would be those whose hearts melt with love and compassion for the suffering in the world. And they would want to show us the way to enlightenment. Uh, they would want to remove our sufferings. That's also a very valid way of, and the great teachers of uh, religion and spirituality have always belonged to the third category. Mm. Yeah. So maybe it depends on what your dharma is, which of those categories you end up in. You know, you have, we all have different functions to play, to serve. True. If you look at the story of the Buddha, after his enlightenment, he was, uh, he wondered whether he should go and teach what he has found. And the last temptation by Mara, I think, was, you are enlightened. I have no far, far further power over you. But then you go into nirvana and give up the body and merge into bliss and uh, don't bother about them. They won't understand what you are saying. Mm -hmm. But the Buddha luckily decided uh, that uh, some will understand. So I will go and teach them to remove their suffering. And so you have the, all the teachings of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So that's the third category, uh, those who become masters of, uh, of humanity. Yeah. Um, Here's a question. This is sort of reminiscent of something we discussed a few minutes ago, and you may, you may not want to answer this, but this is from Jaime Rivera in Lakewood, New Jersey. He asks, would Swami comment on how he experiences life? Do you experience life as awareness? Do you feel as a separate, do you feel yourself to be a separate person? 
I, I think uh, uh, the answer would be yes, more and more. The more and more I investigate Vedanta and I stay with this, I don't even see it as a great achievement. I begin to see it more and more as a statement of fact mm -hmm. that uh, it's true for all of us, for you and me and every other being on this world that we are this consciousness and we experience ourselves as limited individuals experiencing a world. But behind both the individual and the world that the individual experiences underneath or the ground of both is this awareness and it's constantly available to us. You don't even have to become that. You just have to um, you just have to acknowledge that or own up to it, recognize that. So basically the two stages. One is when you become more and more alive to the very possibility of such a thing that the absolute is right here, right now, and it is you yourself. That's stage one. And the stage two is what, the, what I call the shifting of the I. That uh, when I say I, it automatically refers to this thing. When you become aware of that background awareness, then instead of saying it's a background awareness, you say, I am that looking upon this. Then the body mind becomes a this. And then finally, the third stage would be to uh, integrate the entire appearance, the world itself, into this background awareness. In the first stage, the possibility of Brahman, the absolute. The second stage, that I am that Brahman. And third stage is, so is everybody and everything else. Mm. And this, I don't see it as something to be achieved, uh, something particularly great either. The, be the sooner I do it, the better for me and everybody else, I think. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting, those stages you just mentioned, because um, Marj used to talk this way, too, that there was an initial state. Well, firstly, he would say, OK, in meditation, you experience Turiya, you know, pure consciousness. And then through repeated exposure to that, it eventually gets stabilized and is maintained throughout waking, dreaming and sleeping. And yet the world is seen as different from that. There's a sort of yes. a duality set up. And, and but then he said, I, I won't elaborate too long, but then he said, you know, eventually the world, which is seen as different, it, one begins to appreciate its essential nature as that. And so the, the difference kind of melts into a unity where one sees everything in terms of that, in terms of the self, in terms of consciousness. Absolutely. Perfect. I mean, yeah. this is exactly the three stages. Right. First, you stumble upon or you discover that it's real. It's not something I've read about or heard about. Yeah. It's real. It's available to me all the time, always was available, is and will be. And it's my real nature. It's who I am. So that's the first one going to the second stage where the I is shifted now from the body mind to the to do to, to what you have discovered. And finally, everything else, body, mind, and the entire universe is sort of uh, resolved back in your understanding, in your, in the way you look at life, uh, into that reality which is your own self, which you are. Hmm. And even the la language that myself or that is still distancing. Right. Let's be bold enough to say I. Uh, that's the real meaning of the I. Yeah. And that that final stage would seem to really be what Advaita is, because then there's really not two. I mean, one can experience a unified foundation to the universe and yet see the universe as different from that. That's that's a duality. That's not Advaita. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that relates to what we spoke about at the beginning, about science beginning to discover, uh, uh, you know, maybe like a grand unified theory, a, a unity underlying all this appearance. But that still would be a duality, mm -hmm. because that's uh, an intellectual understanding appearing to the consciousness of the scientist who uh, formulates that equation or understands that equation. Here it's a real non-duality where there is no entity apart from you, that non-dual Brahman. Yeah, and that has become a living reality, not just a concept or an understanding. Yes. Yeah, and so speaking of concept and understanding, and we alluded briefly to Neo-Advaita recently, have you run into the whole Neo-Advaita phenomenon very much? That is true. I've read some of the books. And I've, thanks to the internet, I've watched some of the sessions. Yes, um, uh, it has its roots in, I would say, in Ramana Maharshi um, and I would, in the 20th century, maybe Papaji and uh, um, Nisargadatta. Mm -hmm. 
and then a host of other teachers who learned from them and are now teaching all over the world. Yes. Yeah. Although I don't know if Ramana Maharshi and Papaji and Nisargadatta would fully approve of what goes on in in the name of <laughs> of non-duality, or in, in, even in their name, since they're often attributed to be the, the sources of inspiration for for these teachers. But you know, there are things that people like that say, such as you know, call off the search. You're you're already the self. No need to seek for it. No need to make any efforts or engage in any practices. Practices just reinforce the the notion of a practicer, and and uh, you just realize you're that. You're already enlightened, and you know, on and on, um, and. Personally, I you know don't resonate with that those kinds of sayings. I think that they can cause a lot of confusion. Maybe they're applicable and useful for a small percentage of people, but I, you know I think that oh, I don't know. It doesn't matter what I think. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, when I see those uh, sessions, well, let me back up and say first of all, those sayings that uh, you uh, that you are already the self. Why are you meditating? Uh, for uh, the, uh, these uh, sayings are actually not new. Even if you call them new Advaita, they go back centuries or millennia. For example, the Ashtavakra um, uh, Gita and the Avaduta Gita, these are texts of a very radical Advaita. And they say things like, your only bondage is that you are trying to meditate. Mm. <laughs> so things like that. Now, they are true in a very ultimate sense. Um, the Mandukya Upanishad, Mandukya Karika, Gaurapa, the teacher of Shankaracharya's teacher, uh, says that ulti the ultimate truth is that there is no one who is bound, there is no one who has been freed, there is no creation and there is no cessation of creation, and this is the final truth. Now, is it true or not? In a philosophical level, in a logical sense, in a, in a strictly non-dualistic sense, yes, it is true. But now, if you come down to the brass tacks, to the, to the practicalities, I have noticed that sometimes it's not helpful. Right. In some of these sessions, I have noticed the teacher, in many cases, I sense an, an opening and an enlightenment there. But when he's trying to, he or she is trying to communicate it to large numbers of people who are sitting looking at uh, the teacher quizzically, with yearning, with, with genuine uh, uh, need for this, two things are happening. One is, if the teacher has even a little bit of an opening of or, or an, an, a grasp of this, there is a power to what he or she is saying. So that power is felt by everybody who is there. And this is, they sense a deep truth here. But there is no bridge to the truth. So it's like, if I cross over, and there's a narrow little bridge which helped me to cross uh, a chasm or a ravine. And then I cut the bridge and I say, come over. You don't need the bridge. <laughs> this is the truth. Well, they need the bridge. And they need things to do. They need the practices to practice, uh, belief systems to hold on to, while at the same time knowing that these are part of the path and they are not the end. Uh, so they should not be mistaken for the end or anything absolute. In fact, if you look at the traditional teachers of Advaita, Shankara himself, he strongly recommends selfless action. He first of all strongly recommends an ethical life. This is one part of the teaching that's missing. If I am not ethical, if I tell lies, if I go counter to my own inner sense of values, uh, then there itself I have ruined my chances of further progress. If if I keep telling myself, if I if I keep suffering from guilt, for example then the calmness of mind, the clarity of mind that's required for a breakthrough in non-duality, that will not come. So an ethical foundation, very important. Selfless action, unselfishness, very important. Traditional devotion to a deity. Um, it could be a Christian kind of devotion. Vedanta is very liberal that way. It could be a Muslim kind of devotion or devotion to Krishna or the Divine Mother, whatever. But devotion to God, I have heard traditional teachers in the Himalayas tell me this. A non-dualist can only benefit from bhakti. Uh, one of the reasons is on the path of non-dualism, uh, understanding is not so difficult. If you persist with this, very soon a kind of intellectual clarity comes. Vivekananda himself said, this is the direct path, he said, the path of knowledge. 
But many people come to an understanding in this path, few people realize. Uh, the reason is our uh, affections and emotions and desires are all directed towards this pluralistic, dualistic world. Uh, these have to be purified, collected, and focused to, on our search. And bhakti is a very powerful way of doing that. It cleanses the heart and focuses our love and our desire Godward. And then the path becomes much easier. Hmm. Otherwise, what happens is the brain, the intellect agrees. Yes, there is such a thing as pure consciousness. And yes, in a real sense, I am that. But the mind rebels and the body rebels and the emotions rebels. If there's an unpurified body mind structure, which has not gone through rigorous sadhana, it will pull in a different direction. So bhakti yoga is very useful. Meditation, Raja Yoga, extremely useful. Focus is one thing that we are lacking in an increasingly distracted world. So meditation is extremely, I would say, almost necessary for knowledge. And this is what many, not all, but many new Advaita teachers seem to ignore. And uh, the, those who follow them exclusively, they do so at their own peril. I think what happens to many of them is, the, the followers, not the teachers, is that after some time, they end up in a kind of a stagnation. I know all the teachings, I can repeat them, and I'm all sort of convinced, but still I'm suffering. I'm still in the midst of suffering. And so that's, that's the place they end up in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that what often happens is that an intellectual understanding is mistaken for realization. In fact, there's a Tibetan saying that, you know, don't mistake understanding for realization. Um, and, uh, and it can become very convincing and hypnotic even. You drill something into your head enough and you, know, you, can, right. you can repeat it and everything and you think that, oh, that's, that's it, I've got it. Uh, and I think even with the teachers, I think in some cases you give them more credit than they're due. Uh, when you're sitting up in front of a crowd saying this stuff, uh, something lights up inside. You become kind of brighter or more clear than you ordinarily are. Uh, right. And so you, even then you feel like you, you know, you're teaching from a kind of an enlightened or awakened state. But, you know, is that really maintained 24-7? Does, you know, does the rubber really hit the road? And, uh, and does, Correct. Is your behavior throughout your life consistent with that supposed you know, realization? That actually explains the reluctance in uh, uh, traditional monastic orders to claim enlightenment. Yeah. Uh, it's much better to say that I'm a seeker. Even, though if, even if a person is enlightenment, if that person says uh, he or she is a seeker, all credit to him or to her. The worst case is the opposite. When a person is not enlightened, uh, but wants to claim the status of an enlightened master, then the uh, disaster began, begins to unfold. Yeah, I mean, it's like a guy running around saying, I'm a king, I'm a king, I'm a king, convinces himself that he's a king. He's still begging on the street, but yeah. <laughs> but he's convinced himself. And then there's no chance of ever becoming a king because he thinks he already is one. Right. Uh, one test I have personally is, uh, has a person been able to solve his or her own problems? Mm. Uh, I say that if you are enlightened, then you don't have a right to complain. <laughs> yeah. And by solve, it's not to say that, I mean, Ramakrishna and Ramana Maharshi both died of cancer. It's not right. to say that they solved that, but they solved it in the sense that they realized themselves as something untouchable by that. They realize themselves as transcendent. Right. So there is a reality, a really important reality within you, which you are, which transcends these. These are superficial. These are on the surface. It's interesting that you would mention Ramakrishna's cancer. Uh, there's a story how a young man who later became the Swami Turiyananda, he comes when Ramakrishna is suffering from a throat cancer in great pain and asks him, how are you today, sir? And Sri Ramakrishna weakly says, this hurts, I can't eat. And this young man, who's, uh, he says, but sir, I see that you are you're full of bliss. And here, that's a cruel thing to say to a cancer patient. And Ramakrishna bursts out laughing and he says, Oh, the rascal has caught me. He, he has uh, seen through me. <laughs> which means, which is very interesting, is, is, does that mean that he's not suffering from the pain? Oh, yes, he is, just like any other cancer patient. But what he has got, which other cancer patients do not have, is that he is aware of this deeper dimension to his own being, where there is no cancer, no possibility of, uh, of disease or decay or death, and he knows that's his real identity. Mm. 
a woman, let me just find the question here. A woman named um, Rohit uh, sent me a question saying, um, some of the enlightened sages seem to be active after death. Do they get another subtle body after death? And you know what I mean by that? I mean, you, you hear all these stories of, of various masters like Jesus or Ramana or various others coming to people and, um, you know, interceding. In, in many cases, in ca the person has never even heard of that person. I, I, I've spoken to people who didn't, had never heard of Ramana, and Ramana comes to them. And then years later, they see a book, and he has this picture, and that's the guy that I saw, you know. So what's going on there, in your opinion? I believe that's possible. Mm -hmm. um, the traditional idea in, in Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, is the moment you are enlightened, that's the end of the game. As long as this body persists, you remain as an enlightened person, Jivan Mukta, living while uh, free. And when this particular body dies, you don't have any more karma which will produce new bodies. Nature basically brings the game to an end as far as you are concerned, because that's the whole purpose of the game of nature, to make you enlightened. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the less strict uh, versions, versions of uh, Vedanta, in the, say, I would say, the dualistic, more dualistic versions of Vedanta, there are any number of stories and teachings about masters who choose to retain their uh, individuality so that they can go on guiding humanity for centuries to come. And I do believe that. And it, that does not contradict uh, strict non-dualism also, because strict non-dualism has these tiers of reality. There is the absolute paramarthika reality where Brahman alone is real. And there is the vavaharika reality, a, a, a relative plane of reality where you admit God, you admit the saints of God, you admit reincarnation and the possibility of an enlightened master continuing even after the death of one physical body in subtle bodies for a long period of time and guiding disciples and seekers all over the world. Certainly, I think that's quite possible. Mm. Yeah, apparently someone once said to Ramana Maharshi that they told him about the notion of, um, what is that Buddhist thing, the, the Bodhisattva vow, where yes. you're going to keep coming back until all sentient beings are realized. And Ramana laughed and he said, <laughs> it's, just, it's like someone saying, I'm not going to stop dreaming until everybody else stops dreaming. <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's one perspective, definitely. Uh, that's yeah. a very strict, non-dualistic perspective. Yeah. And yet, Ramana Maharshi in other moods you would see he was full of compassion, he even gave bhakti teachings to some people he, who he felt that they would benefit from that. And as you said, Ramana has appeared to others. Uh, it might not be the individual Ramana because Ramana never thought of himself as an individual mm. once he got enlightenment. So it could be something in the cosmic mind where such names and forms like uh, Jesus or Ramana or Ramakrishna or Krishna are conduits for spiritual wisdom. So the same teaching might appear through these forms to certain seekers. The important thing there would be to take the teaching and practice and become enlightened oneself. That's yeah. the really important. So, so in what you said about the cosmic mind, so it may be that there's actually nothing left of the being we referred to as Ramana when he was in a body, but the cosmic mind creates a, a, a projection or an image, a, a hologram of someone who really looks like Rama, Ramana uh, in order to have a certain teaching effect on the people who see it. Quite possible. And our whole question arises because of a, a fundamental, uh, I would say, misconception on our part. When we say Ramana, we mean, mean this person sitting blissfully in a cave, the pictures that we have seen. But that's not how Ramana sees himself. Ramana can completely sees himself as one ocean of existence, consciousness, bliss. So we now have this question, so this person is Ramana. After the death of this body, will this person persist, forgetting that this person does not exist even now hmm. uh, in, in that body? It's difficult for us to grasp. We have the concept of an enlightened person, whereas the enlightened person himself or herself would uh, not consider uh, that I am an enlightened individual being. I'm one with Brahman. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the, to pursue it a little bit further, so we say, let's say, this person doesn't exist. Now, in, in Ramana's case, we might say, well, his body exists in, in a sort of a Nitya kind of way. It's a dependent, it's an appearance. Uh, and so 
even though ultimately it doesn't exist because nothing ever manifested and all that. But um, so could it be that um, even after enlightenment, just as the body apparently at least continues to exist, there's some kind of nugget, some kind of essence of individuality, which through which which makes this this which makes that ultimate reality a living reality, Lesha Vidya concept. Uh, and that that continues to exist in an individuated form as a, as a vehicle through which that enlightened consciousness can continue to function even if the physical body drops off. And then I realize this is all kind of speculative, but I think about these kind of things. No, absolutely. And what you are saying, it tallies well with, um, uh, with the traditional Advaitic account of how is an enlightened master possible? Because the moment you're enlightened, all your karma is destroyed. I mean, backing up a little bit, uh, the idea in Vedanta is these bodies are produced by my past karma. Mm -hmm. I'm an individual sentient being right now under ignorance. I don't know my real nature as Brahman. And I have gone through many lives, generated a lot of karma, and those karmas keep producing these bodies. Now, enlightenment is supposed to wipe out all these karmas. If karmas are wiped out, then there'll be no further bodies. But then the question arises, how is Ramana's body persisting even now after enlightenment? So to answer this question, um, the Lesha Avidya, which you mentioned, this theory, it's a kind of speculation, a kind of sort of philosophical back calculation came up. Define the term just so people understand what that term means. Okay. If enlightenment removes ignorance and all karma is generated from ignorance, so ignorance is gone. You realize you are this ocean of uh, infinite ocean of being and consciousness. You have no more karma, no more ignorance. Then how does one body, the one you are existing in, how does that continue? That should die immediately because this body, you have to remember the background philosophy, this body is fueled by my past karma. If all karma, past and future are wiped out, then this body should die. But that would be very strange. In that case, enlightenment would be a tantamount to suicide. I mean, if you're enlightened, <laughs> you have to die. That would not be very attractive at all. Right. Not only that, um, what Advaita would say is that it leads to the serious problem that uh, if enlightenment leads to immediate death of the body, then all those who are living are not fully enlightened. So no teacher would be a fully enlightened teacher. Then you would, you would run out of teachers very fast. Mm. Uh, so, so to explain all this, they said that uh, the example that they, they use is that all ignorance and all karmas are destroyed except the one which is already giving results right now. And the example they used is here is a bowman shooting arrows and suddenly he decides not to shoot anymore. So he can throw away all the arrows in the quiver. He can even put down the arrow which he was putting on the bow. But the one which he has re released and which is flying towards the target, he can't do anything about that. Mm -hmm. So that persists. In the same way, this particular body, which has karma activated into this particular life, this will continue to give results and the body will live for its natural term. Um, and the enlightened person lives and uh, lives on as an enlightened person. He lives on as a Jivan Mukta. Mm -hmm. now, that's the traditional explanation. It explains how enlightened gurus are possible and why the body does not die and so on and so forth. Yeah. But Shankaracharya in his text Aparokshanubhuti, there he contradicts this flat out. He says this is an explanation given to us because of our fundamental mistake. We see the body and we want an explanation for that. But he says there is no continuation of past karma. Why? First of all, you as Brahman, we were never under the influence of karma. When you become enlightened, you see, the general way we understand enlightenment is, oh, I was an individual sentient being going through many lives and deaths. Now I realize I'm Brahman. I have no further lives, no further births. This is the idea of enlightenment. And Shankaracharya says this is wrong. This is not what happens. When you wake up to your reality, you realize you were never born. There were no past lives and there will, no, there will be no further uh, future life. There is not even this one life. You are Brahman and everything is a manifestation of Brahman. If that's so, there is no karma either. And so the whole theory of some part of karma living, staying behind to fill the, the body of the enlightened person, uh, that falls down. So what is the explanation? The explanation is that from the point of view of Brahman, 
all this world, including the body of the enlightened person, they are all Maya. They are all appearances. They wear appearances and they continue to be appearances. It's not that uh, a real body mind exists along with the uh, the realization that I am Brahman. That would be dualism. Yeah. So, you know, from the perspective, Shankar's perspective that you just articulated, you know, nothing ever happened. No, there is no universe. There is no body. Nothing. It's just all Brahman. And, and we have, again, foam on the surface appearing to be something, but it has no substantial reality. And um, as I understand it, you know, the term mitya kind of relates to this, where you have pots and they're made of clay, and, and uh, you, you could say there's only clay, there are no pots, and yet in, in an apparent, more conditional, more expressed way, you, you, you appear to have pots. You can put beans in them, or water, or use them as drums, or you know, whatever. Um, so, and even though that's not ultimately true, it's kind of relatively true, and to just completely dismiss it, again, seems to be a little bit too much not all-encompassing, too much like taking refuge in one level of reality to the exclusion of the others. You're right, and Shankara does not do that. Mm -hmm. In fact, Shankara fully admits the uh, importance and the value of, of a relative reality, if I might call it so. Mm -hmm. In Advaita Vedanta, this is fully recognized, at least three tiers of uh, reality. The really real, absolute, which is Brahman, mm -hmm. and the relatively real, the transactionally real, the empirically real, which is where you are rake, and I'm the Swami, and we have the computer, and we are talking to each other. Here is a world. All this is admitted by Shankara. He says, in this world of reality, uh, we follow um, morality, follow religion, follow all the codes of conduct. And it's important uh, because your whole Vedantic quest starts from this level. Uh, you don't start with Brahman. And he talks even of, of a third level of uh, reality a lower level of reality, which we might call illusion and dream and error, which is also experience. When you see a snake in a rope, it's not a snake, but you did see something. When you see a dream, you wake up and say, oh, it didn't happen. But you did see the dream, even if it's only a dream. So three levels of reality, Pratibhasika, which literally means illusion or appearance, Vavaharika, which means transactional or empirical or relative, and Paramartika, which means the absolute. So the relative level is fully admitted by the traditional non-dual teachers. In fact, I'll cross over to the other side to Mahayana Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, the great Nagarjuna, who is at the heart of the Madhyamaka philosophy. In one of his uh, verses in the Mula Madhyamaka Karika, he says there are two levels of reality and the Buddha, Buddhas have taught two, two levels of truth. And he says, um, Paramartika and Samvritti. He uses another term, Samvritti. Paramartika means an absolute and Samvritti means the empirical or the relative. Now, he says, Samvritti manashritya paramartikam nadigam yate. Without taking refuge in the relative truth, one cannot realize the absolute truth. So he admits the value of the relative truth. He would say it's empty and Shankaracharya would say it is mithya, it is ultimately false but it has a value in use, like you can store water or milk in a pot. Yeah, though it's clay only. Right. Yeah. So without taking refuge in the relative truth, you cannot realize the absolute truth, you just said. And as you said that, the way I interpreted it would, was that you have to sort of um, give appropriate attention and care to your relative life and your relative faculties if they are going to serve you as vehicles for realization of the absolute truth. In other words, if you don't eat or if you just totally, you know, do whatever that damages your, your nervous system and pollutes your mind and so on, then, and you, and you say to yourself, it doesn't matter because it's all Maya, then you're not going to realize the absolute truth. Is that the implication of that statement you just said? Absolutely. The relative world we inhabit uh, is extremely valuable for spiritual life, even for non-dual spiritual life. As one of our senior Swamis used to say, uh, don't abuse the horse you can't dismount from. <laughs> <laughs> don't point. abuse any horses anyway, but <laughs> don't abuse the one you cannot dismount, dismount from. That's the body. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's one way of putting it. Another thing is, we need to ask ourselves what we are experiencing right now, right now. Uh, if, if I don't think I'm an enlightened person, 
what am I experiencing right now? The answer from a student of Vedanta might be, oh, you are experiencing the word. This is the word. Meaning somewhere implicit in the mind of that person is Brahman is something else. Hmm. That's not true. What you are experiencing right now is the world laced with Brahman, is the world on a foundation of Brahman. You are in experiencing world and Brahman together right now. What Vedanta enables you to do is to separate the two in your understanding. In fact, Vedanta says what ignorance does, what Maya does is inside us, it hides the reality that we are Atman. We think we are only body mind. Mm. Outside us, it hides the reality that Brahman is everything. We think it's a word. But both inside and outside us, Brahman is there ever present, ever presented to us. So right now we are seeing world plus Brahman. Don't dismiss this. If you dismiss this, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. In fact, uh, we can put it this way. Falsity in itself is weak. A lie or an error or falsity in itself is weak. What is deadly, what is lethal is falsity laced with the truth. Hmm. What we are experiencing now is Maya on a foundation of Brahman. That's why it seems so real to us. Yeah, kind of sounds like the term disinformation, which is often used in, in political discussions or something. There's, there's falsity laced with the truth, which makes it sound credible, but which right. actually makes it all the more insidious. And dangerous. Yeah. Yes. You must learn to separate the two in your understanding. Yeah. This experience will still continue even after an enlightenment. If you have a body and a mind, you're going to open your eyes, you're going to see forms. You've got ears, you're going to hear sounds. If you have a mind, you're going to think. You've got a tummy, you're going to feel hungry. But all of this appears as name and form and the background reality is understood to be Brahman. Right now, the reality and the name and form are mixed up so that this seems real. This seems real for a very real reason that you, the reality, are present right here. You are lending it reality. Hmm. So here's a question from Declan Cooley from Krakow, Poland. He asks, would Swami mind saying something on Kashmir Shaivism and its relationship to Advaita Vedanta, as this has been a major influence on me via Rupert Spira and others? Can you recommend good books and authors on Vedanta? I guess like two separate questions there. All right. Kashmir Shaivism um, is a tradition um, a philosophical, mystical, spiritual tradition from Kashmir, uh, which originated about 1200 or 1400 years ago. The central texts of which are most important is the Shiva Sutras. Uh, then you have texts like uh, the Spandakarika, uh, Vijjana Bhairava. So, and it's a very powerful, it's a non-dualistic system. So in that sense, it's very similar to Advaita Vedanta. I've seen many non-dualist Advaitins become very interested in Kashmir Shaivism. In fact, I, there was a book by Professor Chandradhar Sharma the, uh, on the non-dualist traditions of India. And there he included Advaita Vedanta, Kashmir Shaivism, uh, Vishishta Advaita Vedanta, uh, the Vijjanavada Buddhism, and the Madhyamaka Buddhism. So five traditions included as uh, uh, non-dualistic traditions. Kashmir Shaivism, before you plunge into it, if you are coming from a non-dualistic, from an Advaitic background, you need to know the differences first uh, before you see the similarities. F straight off, most important difference, I would say, first of all, the world is real in Kashmir Shaivism. Kashmir Shaivism says the ultimate reality is Parashiva, the absolute Shiva, they call, so Shaivism means a, a teaching, the, a, a, the path of Shiva. So the absolute reality is called Shiva and the world is a vibration of the consciousness of which is Shiva. So being a vibration of Shiva, it's real. Uh, it's not Maya, it's not an appearance, but it's a manifestation of Shiva and a real manifestation of Shiva. That's one. And the second thing is, uh, Brahman is pure consciousness and existence and bliss in, in Vedanta. Even if, if you can say something, you can say this much, but it actually goes beyond that uh, into silence. But in Kashmir Shaivism, it's not just pure consciousness. Uh, it's also it has the ability to uh, be reflexive. It is aware. It is self aware. That is, I am pure awareness and aware of myself, too. And that gives it the potential to vibrate and produce the universe. So 
prakasha. The word prakasha means light. And it could be a very good way of defining Advaita Vedanta, Brahman, that you are light itself. Light means not physical light, light of consciousness. Whereas in Kashmir Shaivism, the term they use is Prakasha Vimarsha. Prakasha is consciousness and Vimarsha is uh, a reflexive awareness of itself. So these are some fundamental differences. But what is attractive about Kashmir Shaivism is Advaita Vedanta seems to be the path of knowledge par excellence. But Kashmir Shaivism says, we can start at different levels depending upon the seeker. So they speak about four ways. Uh, one way is uh, Anupai, the no way way, uh, where you are spontaneously awakened. You hear of uh, teachers being spontaneously awakened, something like Ramana Maharshi, for example. He really did not go through a particular tradition before he became awakened. So that's the way, that's the highest. You can spontaneously become awakened, but it's no use sitting and waiting around for that. So the next one they say is the uh, Shambhavopai, the way of Shambhu or Shiva, which is very close to Advaita Vedanta. It's a path of knowledge where you, your own nature as consciousness is investigated and pointed out and you're enlightened. The third one is called Shaktopai, the way of Shakti, where you have the importance of meditation. You have the importance of mantras. The whole science of mantras is developed, which really Advaita Vedanta does not go into. So you have the whole science of mantras. And then you have the fourth way, which is uh, ritualistic, where you are regarded as an individual being a very common sense, practical approach where all kinds of rituals and uh, practices are recommended. So it's a step by step, a slower approach to enlightenment. This is very attractive for many seekers where you have a wealth of techniques. For example, the book by Vigyana Bhairava, it gives you 112 techniques of meditation. Uh, many of them are pretty, are, are very interesting. You know, for example, we talked about, about a, a pot. Imagine a clay pot. Now, one of the techniques is look into the clay pot and concentrate on the space in the clay pot. And then in your mind, dismiss the enclosing uh, part. Uh, that's supposed to make your mind free of conceptions. Mm. If you do it intensely enough, uh, it, exp it removes limitations and uh, uh, the conceptions in your mind, making it uh, conceptionless or transcending thought. Mm. Like that, there are many interesting techniques in Vigyana Bhairava. So that's uh, my take on Kashmiri Shaivism. I could go on and on. <laughs> and as you can see, I'm a I'm not a Kashmiri Shaivite, but I'm an enthusiast. Yeah. Actually, that leads into something I'd like to discuss in our remaining minutes. We probably won't really have a chance to do justice to it. We'll have to have another talk one of these days. But um, it seems to me that uh, an emphasis on the world as Maya, in a way, doesn't do justice to the beauty of it and the intricacy of it and the, the amazing, marvelous, and vast intelligence that seems to be intrinsic to every little bit of it and um, and you know I alluded to that earlier in in terms of my understanding of what God is that you know God is hiding in plain sight and everything we see is just such a marvelous play and display of, of divine intelligence um, that to just dismiss it as total illusion almost seems disrespectful to God uh, so um, I'm and perhaps unrealistic so I'm just and it also implies that the the creation is just sort of a mistake that you want to get out of as quickly as possible as opposed to sort of a divine play that is profoundly meaningful and and purposeful and and you know necessary so that's enough of i mean that's not really a question but i'm sure you can respond to those thoughts and just give your perspective uh, right uh, in fact uh, maya doctrine has been often misunderstood a great teacher uh, said this about the Maya doctrine. It has two, it's, it's a methodology. It's a methodology. It has two purposes. The first preliminary purpose is to take your mind away from the world and plunge it into the inquiry into what you are really, into the discovery of Brahman. That's the first thing. Uh, otherwise, if you're too entranced with this world of names and forms, you'll never proceed on the inquiry, n number one. But the deeper meaning of the doctrine of Maya is very interesting. Maya literally means that this here right now, this is Brahman. 
Maya, what does Maya say? Things are not what they seem. This world is an appearance, but appearance of what? Of Brahman. The snake is an appearance. Appearance of what? The rope. If the snake is false and the rope is true, let me ask you, where is the rope? Right where you see the snake. So where is Brahman? Right where you are seeing people and animals and plants and the world and problems? Right here, right now, this is Brahman. So to say that the world is Maya is also equivalent to saying that the world is Brahman. In fact, if you did not say it is Maya, if you say this world is real, then you would have to have another real thing called Brahman. Right now, the doctrine of Maya actually tells you the presence you are living in, that is Brahman. One way it has been put, and I think very powerfully, where is God most present? And the answer was from our teacher, not in Banaras or in Jerusalem or Vrindavan or in Mecca. There God is present, no doubt, powerful presence. But more than that, God is present here where you are because you are Brahman. Hmm. When is God most present? In heaven after death or uh, on holy days like um, um, Shivaratri or Christmas or, uh, or Eid? Yes. Those days are holy and you can feel the presence of God more in those those times. But even more than all of those holy days com com combined, God is most present right now because you are present right now. And in what is God most present? Is it, pre is it present in the temples or churches or pictures? Yes, God is present there. But with God is most present in you. So most present in you, most present now, most present here. This is what Maya actually means. Mm. And it seems to me when we look at what we're actually, when we think about what we're actually looking at and, um, you know, how much science, what science has told us about when you're looking at a flower, the, the amazing miracle that you're actually seeing and how the flower operates and all, we're looking at this vast, uh, incomprehensible intelligence doing its thing. And it seems to me that what, what that implies is that Brahman can a quality of as it were of Brahman is vast infinite intelligence if we equate Brahman with God with consciousness all those terms equivalent then you know we're saying that you know Brahman isn't again not some plain vanilla ultimate reality but is just brim full of potentiality and uh, intelligence and you know um, creative potential and and so on um, maybe I'm getting more into Kashmir Shaivism territory than Vedanta, but that's the kind of thinking I resonate with. Um, in fact, Advaita Vedanta and its final analysis does not actually dismiss the word. Mm -hmm. What it, what, um, what Advaita does is it makes you limitless. You see, in a dualistic form of uh, thinking, there is a limit, a boundary, God and word, sacred and secular. If both are real, then there must be two separate things. Uh -huh. If both are not real, one of them is real and the other is not, then what we consider to be the world is pervaded by this one, as you said, one intelligence, one existence, consciousness, bliss. Now, they, if, you see, if you look at it in a dualistic way, am I going to be a scientist or a saint? In a dualistic way, you have to be a saint because uh, after all, you, if you want to be a spiritual seeker, that's the thing to do. And the scientist is something different because it's a dualistic world. He is of the world and you are of heaven. But if it's non-dualistic, you can be a saintly scientist or a scientific saint. Sure. Yeah. It, there's, the limits are dissolved. Yeah. Good. Well, we better wrap it up. You have to eat lunch and get over to Princeton. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> Thank don't, you, Rick. I don't, I don't want you to speed. Um, or your driver to speed. And uh, there's so much more we could talk about. For instance, I, you inspired me to read the Ashravakra Samhita, which I did and took three pages of notes. So we can have another conversation one of these days and go into that. Absolutely. And other I look things. forward to that. Yeah. So let me make a couple of quick wrap up points and then we'll conclude. Um, so those who've been watching or listening have been watching or listening to an episode of Buddha the Gas Pump, an ongoing series of conversations with, with spiritually awakening people. There have been hundreds of them uh, so far. And if you dive into our archives, you can check all those out. And hopefully, God willing, there will be hundreds more. Um, so stay tuned. Come to the website if you like, batgap.com. Sign up for the email. 
um, check out the other menu items and you'll see what, what is there to see. So uh, thanks a lot. And Swamiji, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. You take care. You too. Have a good day. Thank you. Yeah.